Block number two of the MPH Hour here on News Talk Saga 960 AM. I'm your host, Jason Tom. And over the last few years, there's been a lot of talk about the NCAA and the billions of dollars that they pull in off the backs of student athletes in the two big sports that fund so many high-level programs in America, football and basketball. It's a powder keg issue and the fuse is shorter than ever. Most believe these student athletes should lose the title of amateur and not only be paid, but also be able to make money off of their likeness. There are now more options than ever for the most elite players to forego the NCAA altogether and still make their NBA dream come true. But even if the draft rules change to once again allow high schoolers to go directly to the NBA, there are very few players good enough to successfully make that jump and succeed in the long term. So why not focus on what these student athletes are getting? A free education, an increased network, and unique life experiences, something that not many players are focused on because they believe every ounce of their energy should be put into the game itself. That's what Braden Anderson did at a young age. From a small town in Alberta, he chased his basketball dreams to different American high schools because back then, that was how it was done. There was no real pathway here at home. And you know what? It worked. Anderson earned a scholarship to the University of Kansas, a powerhouse program coached by Bill Self. But even after he had started summer classes and scored a huge number on the SATs, he was ruled academically ineligible because the NCAA did not accept some of the credits he received at a school they said simply didn't exist. It happens more than you think. And that could have been the end of his story. But two other D1 schools later, Braden became the poster boy for NCAA student athletes and the value they do receive in the form of a scholarship. It's something that doesn't happen enough, and this New York City lawyer wants to change that with the clarity he now has about the process he lived through. And no one can argue that he worked the system to perfection. Braden Anderson, Okotoks, Alberta native, former NCAA student athlete, law school graduate, currently a lawyer specializing in financial regulatory law. Braden, tell us about the law firm where you work because pretty heavy hitting group, I think, down there, right? Yeah, um, so it's, it's Sidley Austin. Uh, it's a Chicago-based law firm. Um, I believe it's uh, around like the fifth or sixth largest in the U.S. Um, we have you know over 20 offices across the globe. Uh, I work in a New York office, uh, which is pretty decent size. I think we have like five or six hundred lawyers. Um, uh, as you correctly noted, doing financial regulatory law, um, you know, mainly representing banks and financial institutions. The firm's claim to fame. Most people know Sidley because that's where Barack and Michelle Obama met. They mm. actually, Michelle was Barack's boss in the, in the Chicago office. Uh, and that's, that's how they met was um, Barack was like an intern. He was a summer associate. And Michelle was like a second or third year and was assigned as his mentor. Um, and that's actually how they met. So that is a great story. <laughs> to start it off, yeah. uh, to start off this interview. And you're really an example of the true value of an athletic scholarship and what can come from someone who keeps academics at the forefront. Just straight up, what's your advice to, to, these, to these players that have the skill to have the opportunity to go D1, but maybe aren't thinking about what the institutions offer academically and maybe making decisions strictly uh, off a of basketball sense? Well, you, you have to understand the game you're playing. There's not a lot of transparency or, or understanding at all from the players. You, you have great, great players. They're super naive, and they just eat up whatever these programs feed to them, right? And they're feeding the same thing to every single recruit. There is a business of basketball. Bottom line, it's a business. And so when you're approaching this, you need to think about where you fit into this business. Are you Andrew Wiggins? Are you Carl Anthony Towns? Are you Zion Williamson? Or like, who are you? What is, what is your path? Because those are one in a million type of players. And so if you're not that player, 
right? And if the, if the coaching staff doesn't believe you are that player, then you need to make sure that you're making really strategic decisions throughout your journey to just make sure that you're taking advantage of what you're being given and looking out for number one, yourself, right? Like you have to do that because no one's going to do that for you. And student athletes, bottom line, are paid with education. I don't think anyone's made more money, derived more value from playing college basketball than I have. I'll just throw it out there. I don't think so. If you add up, right, because if you graduate early, Mm -hmm. right, I graduated in three years, and then I got two years of law school paid for. This is like $220,000 worth of value just in law school, right? And then you add up the undergrad it's getting pretty close to 120 or something that depends, you know, how you calculate living expenses, but then you just take the sat, you know, the tuition and stuff, and you put that to the side, living expenses, all, the real cost of education, put it aside. Now you can do another analysis, right? Finance bros across the world are thinking, right? What's your model? You know, how are you going to do this? Right? Well, I think you, you take future earnings, right? You can do that calculation. Someone who had a 2.0 in college has a different value of their education than someone who had a 3.6. It's just different. It's going to open up different types of opportunities to you. It's going to mean different things in terms of your earning power. And I think examples like mine, frankly, and I think examples like Julian's are Julian Clark, brain surgeon, right? Like these are examples of, listen, if you take my, my career salary earnings and you add up that number and you, and you add up Julian Clark's, you know, complete salary, you know, career earning number, it's a big number and it's a bigger number than most players who go play pro. Most people who make it to the NBA, bigger number than they'll ever take home. And so it's just something to think about. There's other ways to be a millionaire, right? There's, and so just, I think having more options for these athletes, it's got to make you feel better because I think people feel really pressured to, I got to make it to the NBA. I got to make, or, or make it to the best league overseas, or I can't buy my mom a house, or I can't feed myself or I'm a failure. And it's just not true. When did you decide you wanted to be a lawyer? And, 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 you know, was that before Seton Hall transferring there? And, and, and like, I, I think I remember talking to you at that time, that was went into the decision-making there. I mean, your, your recruiting visit was, you know, show me what I'm going to be doing academically. For me, I I think there was a shift, obviously when I broke my neck, you know, Mm -hmm. in, in Fresno state, sad story, drunk driver, break your neck. I always cared about academics, um, but I think when something like that happens to you, like you're in a car, you're with your buddies, everything's fine. You know, I just transferred from Kansas. I was about to play in my first full season. I was ready to go. I had just got back from the Team Canada pre-Olympic team. I was just working out with Tristan and Steve Nash and, and everybody, and, you know, I was ready to go. You know, I just spent a month and a half with Steve Nash. You know, I was so excited to I play my that, first yeah. full season. And I thought I was doing one year and I was out of there. And so, you know, it, I still care about school, but like something like that happens to you and it, it just changes your perspective overnight. You know, um, I had that like dramatic, ridiculous conversation that like, you know, I, when I think about it, it's like, it's Friday night lights. It's when Booby miles asks the doc, he's like, Hey doc, am I going to be able to play again? And it's this like ridiculously, you know, dramatic scene. And, and you see it in movie and movie and movie and TV show. And like that happened to me in real life. Wow. I asked my surgeon, Gene Carrigy, who was a tremendous surgeon at, up at Stanford. He did Peyton Manning's yep. neck surgery. And I asked him that question. I was like, doc like am i gonna be able to play and he was like i don't know man you know and that and like you could tell he was being genuine and he was just like i just don't know this is like i really don't and that put enough fear into my heart that i was like man like 
this is, it's crazy that you can sacrifice everything and, and put 20 years into a game and, um, and you can lose it all, right. You can lose it all because of one, you know, 20 minute car ride. And, um, luckily, obviously I was able to come back and play again, but I think I, I was more careful, um, in a lot of ways, I think mentally it affected me. Mm. Um, you know, when you know that you have that, that insecurity at, at that level, I, I think it, it didn't render me able to be as reckless on the boards, for example, as I used yeah. to be. And to just, I, I used to be recklessly aggressive with my body. And I think you just, even if it's not conscious, yes. you just kind of don't play that same way, you know? You were ruled academically ineligible at Kansas, and you'd scored a 1450 on the SAT, already had A's in summer classes. But, you know, when we've talked about this before, what I want to ask you is, what would your advice be to players coming up now who still, like, they do their best in class, but they leave that portion, they leave the NCAA eligibility portion to a coach or to someone else, how involved should a player be even in, in something like grade nine, grade 10, if they know that they want to get to that level? Again, it comes down to perspective of like what, what you're trying to do. I think um, for most players, the academic piece is like your ticket. That is your ticket. It, that is the big opportunity for you. And, and, and until the rules change and until things change dramatically with this amateur system, this is your compensation. Um, and so you have to treat it that way. I have to be honest, right? Like there are some players who are so good that we can't take that patriarchal view of trying to control and manage yeah. and, and, and try to micromanage people. It's like, no, no, no. That's a professional athlete right there. Mm -hmm. And, and, if you're that good, you know, it, it, it's, it's really not even our place as a society to say, oh, well, you know, you got to go to class. And that's why the fiction of the, the amateur system is an issue. It, it, it's not an issue for everybody. It's not an issue for the 99%. It's an issue for the 1%. Because the 1% of are the ones driving the majority of revenue. Yeah. They're the ones single-handedly winning ball games and, and filling the seats and 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 driving ridiculous viewership and, and creating millions and billions of dollars the ranking system shouldn't be kansas kentucky duke although rock chalk jayhawk for life um still have a lot of love for, for that program um it should probably be harvard yale columbia Penn, right it probably, i'm just telling you if you're doing the analysis on on bang for your buck and, and, and kind of the value of your efforts, that's, that's highly valuable, man. <laughs> that degree is highly valuable. You're going to be cashing at minimum six-figure checks, even if you stumble out of that place with the degree. Yeah. Stumble. You're, you know what I mean? And, yeah. and people just don't think about that, and they don't know that, you know, that most of my friends playing overseas – they don't know this number. It's a sad number. People are, and I don't, I'm, I'm scared to share it, to, to, re, to, to discourage people. I'm not even going to share it. it. It's not a high number. Most people playing overseas are making a, a low amount of money, a, an amount lower than you would make with a great college degree and a good job. It, you know, and I just think people need to consider that, that it's okay, right? Loving the game is one thing. We yeah, all love yeah. the game, but you don't need to feel that pressure. There's a lot of pressure that you can feel that my teammates had, that people I was playing with had, that it was like, if they didn't make this thing happen, yeah. that it was like their life was over yeah. and there was nothing else for them in the world. And it's preyed on that desperation and that, you know, the fact that you need them and you can make these players run through walls for you. And, and I just think more people need to know, you know, there's a bigger picture here. And, and there are other options for me. The last thing I wanted to hit on was, was you mentioned there, um, you know, pressure and, and, you know, student athlete, law school, overcoming a catastrophic injury, all of that 
how did it get you ready discipline wise perspective wise to succeed now in everything you are dealing with like it must be tough to rattle you at this point you know it's tough i it's i think there's like rare moments where it's like okay i can't that one i can't weasel around and like try to be humble or something um yeah I, I, and, and I'll, I'll i'll phrase it this way because i want to motivate other student athletes hearing this like if like for me for example i was homeless at 12 and this isn't by the way like i'm not unique i don't think i'm special I've played with a lot of people who had just as hard lives as me and, and been through everything I've been through and more. Right. But just to put it in perspective, I was homeless at 12, lived on people's couches, had one opportunity with Ro Russell to go live in an apart in an apartment building with 16 boys and duke it out and, you know, scratched and clawed and moved away from my whole family at 15 and, and, and lived at these little basketball schools along the way. And Scratch and Claude was never a person who was supposed to go to college, never a person who was supposed to graduate high school. I worked regular jobs when I was 14. I washed dishes. I did landscaping. I, I did stone masonry. I, I did everything I could just to eat. Um, and being having gone through all that, having gone through running 10 miles every morning at 5 a.m., spending seven, eight hours a day in the gym, studying every hour in between, getting three, four hours of sleep, trying to study and make it happen, burn it on, a, on both ends, competing on the court, competing in the weight room, competing in the classroom. You really can't rattle that person, period. Forget me. You just can't rattle that person. And I think the bigger thing is when you compare that person with the, the person in the professional world, and it's no knock on them. Because of course, I want my children to have a much easier life than me. That's what I'm working so hard for. But I'm competing against people who have had a very easy life. And them to them, adversity and challenge is just not what that is to me. And I'm not knocking them, yeah, yeah. right? But it's just a much different deal. So, you know, when we talk about working in big law and working in finance and working at these big firms and that that's hard and working in New York is hard, I can tell you, that for people like us, and I'm talking to all these student athletes out here who've been through it, it's not hard for us. We're built for this. We're built for this. I'm serious. And it's, and it's, it's not possible to compete with us. It's just not. If you get an education, if you get that experience and that opportunity to try to compete with that kid who went to private school all the way, never had to really work hard for much, had all, every opportunity, it's just impossible to compete with you. It's just not possible. Don't really know what else to say to that. Braden Anderson, thank you for coming on the MPH hour and spitting some truth. And, uh, you know, I don't think I'm ever going to see, uh, see you in a courtroom. Thank goodness. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I appreciate you coming on man and, and sharing that to the next generation. Just an amazing story, possibly the most interesting man coming from Canadian basketball that no longer plays the sport, but I'm sure you're killing it in those lawyer pickup games. Thanks so much, man. Really appreciate it, Jason. And, um, you know, best of luck to everybody out there. I, I want folks to know back home, just if there's anybody who has questions, please reach out to me. This is, it, it's one of my purposes now. Just please reach out. Like, just, just let me know if you have questions, need advice. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to, I'm happy to talk to you. I didn't get big time on anybody. You heard the name Julian Clark mentioned in that interview. And if you missed my interview with Dr. Clark, who's on the home stretch to becoming a neurosurgeon, please check it out on our North Pole Hoops YouTube channel. It's worth a listen to hear these two young men speak so passionately about this topic. NCAA scholarships are something that is still pretty new to the basketball world here in Canada and the education of how to maximize all that comes with it is something that is still lacking. Not only just here in Canada, U.S. student athletes face the same problem and it's usually because they're thinking short term and not playing the long game. Next on the MPH Hour, we head back to the CEBL and talk to a Montreal native who is back in the league for a second season while looking forward to next year when his home city will see a CEBL franchise land in its community. 
Kemi Osei of the Saskatchewan Rattlers is up next on the NPH Hour here on News Talk Saga 960 AM.